Thanks very much, Jennifer. And uh, thank you to the Clondalkin Task Force for the invitation to speak here today. Um, can you hear me? Hold on. Okay. I don't want to go too close to it. Because <laughs> calibration. Um, so um, I, I'm not an expert in this particular area of uh, drugs, um, but I do remember you mentioned the National Economic and Social Council 21 years ago, and I was working there. I think Pat Rabbit was the minister, uh, and there was the first sort of drug strategy was launched then, and it was a time of, um, uh, it was a, a very interesting time to be involved in social partnership and discussion because um, uh, the issue of drugs had come on the agenda in the National Economic and Social Council and, um, and public policy making in a way that was very um, exceptional. Um, it, it, it was around the time of the murder of uh, Veronica Gern and um, it, it uh, concentrated minds uh, around the whole issue of the links between uh, drugs and, and, and crime and, but also, um, and I think this was the interesting part about it, we were be making the links between uh, community uh, um, and the vulnerabilities of communities to poverty and marginalization and the connections between these things and the whole issue of, of, uh, of, um, of drugs. And um, so in a sense we were uh, at working at a macro level in NESC and linking up with quite specific uh, issues. And uh, in fact, uh, th there was one civil servant, I won't mention the name, but they said to me, like, what are we doing this stuff in an NESC strategy about the economy for, you know? Um, and I thought to myself, oh, here we go. This is what we're up against, that you can't actually see the connection between social and uh, economic uh, strategy and policy. Um, uh, and in, in fact, indeed, the NESC strategy went on to have quite a bit about uh, these issues. But it was also an interesting uh, time because it was at that time that the community and voluntary pillar came into existence as a key partner, a social partner in the social partnership negotiations. And they were admitted in um, 1996. And they participated in a quite influential in shaping uh, an agreement called uh, Partnership 2000, and this was the first strategy, first of these agreements to include the word inclusion as a kind of key term in the title, and then that became the basis, sorry, the, the strategy that Ness wrote was called uh, Strategy into the 21st Century, and it included the concept of inclusion. Then we had Partnership 2000 based on that, and this was the first time that the community pillar were actually inside the room, inside the tent, or inside whatever it is you want to call it, um, they became part of the elite. Uh, um, as somebody, a colleague of mine said to me around that time, he said, uh, we were at some gathering of, uh, I think there were actually a lot of community workers and youth workers, and he said to me, if you threw a stone in this room, you'd probably hit a social partner. Um, such was the, the extent to which the concept of social partnership was being broadened out at that time. So, um, so we use the term social partnership uh, in Ireland, um, and we, we use the term partnership, and we often uh, overlay the two, and sometimes we confuse the two. So I thought that uh, what I would try to do today would be to um, make a, a few points about uh, social partnership uh, and local partnership, um, and maybe define what I mean by those and distinguish between them. Uh, and then to look at the fact that in Ireland we have a hybrid of social partnership and local partnership. And one of the key elements in that hybrid uh, process, hybridization that took place, um, uh, sorry for using words like hybridization, and you'll see I use words like asymmetric engagement as well, but uh, I was brought up in a family that always used to say, you know, uh, don't express something in words of two syllables when words of three or more will suffice. So I, can't, I find it hard to get out of the habit. Um, um, so I shouldn't blame my family for that. Anyway, um, so one of the innovative parts of, this, of, the, of the kind of hybrid in the Irish uh, case was the, uh, the introduction of the community and voluntary pillar. And that concept of the community and voluntary pillar also led people to, to ask questions about the nature of our social partnership and whether something was happening that was really exciting and important or whether in fact it was uh, a deeply pessimistic development. Um, but there were various different uh, sort of views on that. And this uh, led me in fact on to eventually to 
uh, to do my doctorate on the subject of the community and voluntary pillar as it happens, um, and hence the, 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 um, the name with more than two syllables uh, for the book that I wrote about that. Um, so I want to reflect a little bit on what is, might be the significance of that and also uh, then to maybe so, say a few very, very brief words about maybe what is the future in terms of state voluntary sector relationships in Ireland because obviously the landscape has changed quite a, quite a bit. Uh, maybe I should put this into, oh, it's coming up in full size here. That's okay, yes, it's, it's, it looks different on the screen here. Okay, so first of all, social partnership. What is social partnership? Uh, a social partner maybe is the easiest thing to, we start with a social partner. Social partner is a less adversarial word for trade unions and employers. So instead of talking about the class struggle, we talk about the social partners. Okay, so that's basically uh, in a nutshell. So the, the social partnership, in a sense, is the employers and the unions. Sitting and sitting down and 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 negotiating in some form uh, across uh, across the, the table, um, and uh, it, it um, in this context, it, it, the name neo corporatism was it was invented after the Second World War. Um, uh, Neo meaning new, but corporatism meaning corporate bodies. So these two corporate bodies, the, the peak organization of the, the unions, the peak organization of the employers, would sit down, uh, and often they would sit down, and usually they sat down along with the government, and they would hammer out a three-sided sort of agreement. Um, and, um, uh, so, and, and, and this was known as corp neo-corporatism because it was after post-Second World War. Corporatism meant something very different after the First World War, before the Second World War, we won't go into that. Uh, but in this, in this post-war era of the growth of the welfare state, the unions were quite influential. Social democracy was on the rise. And so we talk about societal corporatism, corporatism because this is society um, emerging and demanding and uh, improving wages and the social wage, developing the welfare state, Keynesian economic policy, all the rest of it. So uh, that was the kind of predominant pattern until the 1980s. And then you, it gave way when you had other forms of corporatism emerging in the 80s. We call it uh, supply-side corporatism or uh, uh, state-directed corporatism, which emphasized structural reform and was often dealing with challenges of austerity. And the, the choice was often put before uh, societies of, are you going to go down the, the, the neoliberal, um, decentralized sort of liberal market approach, or are you going to have a corporatist approach where we try and get people to agree? But often they were agreeing on sacrifices that would be exchanged for promised uh, benefits in the future. And that's indeed what happened in the Irish case. So in its essentials then, uh, social partnership in this context means a sort of a tripartite model with the state, the employers and the unions uh, working together. So the state get involved in things that are, no are normally left to the unions and the employers and the unions and the employers get involved in things that are normally left to the state. So in that way there's a kind of a, 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 a complex bargaining or political exchange system set up. Um, and it can include things like taxation, wage bargaining, uh, but other things, distribution more generally, and also productivity. So the, the key modality in this concept is, is bargaining um, and, and tripartite bargaining. So bargaining is a kind of a, it's a particular modality of rebalancing uh, things in society. Uh, other modalities would be you elect the government and the, the government decides, so, but Bargaining is, becomes an important uh, modality uh, in, in, uh, 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 besides, uh, besides uh, the s simple, straightforward, representative, democratic way of doing things. Um, and of course, there are all sorts of arguments about whether you know, the one is strengthening the other or taking away from the other. So in the Irish context, then, the experience of bargaining has gone through various phases. During the 1970s, we actually had a centralized system of wage bargaining. Um, uh, but it was bipartite, so there was a thing called the Employer, Employer Labour Conference, and they negotiated on wages, but that wasn't coordinated with what the government was doing. Um, and the system was demand side, so the, the government were spending money and the unions were looking for higher wages to compensate for the inflation that was happening at the time. So you had a continuation of inflation in the 1970s and um, wages were, in a sense, increasing in monetary terms but not increasing in real terms. But you also had uh, high levels of unemployment and increasing. And these weren't going away just because the government was using uh, old-style um, conventional kind of Keynesian methods. In the 1980s, that broke down, and for six or seven years, we had decentralized collective bargaining. Um, and this was a time of a weak economy, uh, also a weak government, and rising national debt. And we had extensive poverty, growing marginalization of communities over this time. 
um, which, which provides an important backdrop to uh, the context uh, uh, the rise of, uh, of community um, uh, and voluntary organisations and, and, and subsequent um, developments in social partnership. So in 1987 we had a return to an attempt at, at coordinating the various um, actors, the, the social partners, um, and again, it was a return to centralised bargaining. This was under the Hohi government of 1987, and um, it was coordinated, and, uh, but it was supply side in emphasis. So it was dealing with structural problems. It was attempting to get down national debt. The unions went in knowing that they weren't going to get wage increases in the short run. Uh, they had to wait until the economy turned around, um, uh, which, which as, as we know, it did. Uh, and, and we refer to this sometimes as competitive corporatism. At this stage, the community and voluntary pillar didn't exist, um, but the, and, and, but the uh, community sector were outside. So apologies for this uh, slide. Uh, the, the, uh, some of the words have slipped out of their boxes, um, so you can't really see them, but I'm not going to spend very long on it. But just to say that there was, a, there was a phase between 1987 and 1996 when the trade unions and the employers and the farmers were in social partnership, but the community sector were outside. Okay? And then from 1980, uh, 1996 and 97 onwards, uh, the community and voluntary pillar was created. And the, this brought a new element into social partnership um, um, with, with many uh, community and voluntary organizations funneled into what became the community and voluntary pillar uh, and participated in that system. And that was a tripartite system. And unlike the negotiations of the 1970s, it was coordinated, so there was greater coordination between public policy and what the unions and the employers were negotiating uh, on, the, on the wage front. Um, and this all continued until uh, 2008 with the global financial crisis and the, um, the ensuing uh, kind of um, uh, um, uh, catastrophic effects that that had on, 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 on our society. Now, so that's social partnership, if you like, a pen picture. Uh, it, distinct from that is the concept of local partnership, which is, which is quite different. Uh, and local uh, or area-based partnership, uh, essentially, um, uh, in the Irish case, has its origins, can go back to the 1980s with the Combat Poverty Agency and the European Poverty Programs of the 1980s. They were focused on pilot projects to tackle poverty and marginalization. And the methodology was decentralized, local, area-based approaches. And there were pilot projects. And these projects were analyzed and evaluated. And um, lessons were drawn, not just in Ireland, but across Europe. And there are many people in the room here, or certainly some people in the room here uh, today, who had a, a direct uh, involvement in some of these projects, uh, hi, Jim, <laughs> uh, back, in the, back in, the, in the late 1980s. And um, uh, so in, in the, the local area partnerships, uh, the local area-based area approach um, had partners partners, but the partners were coming from the voluntary sector. So we use the term partner in a different way than in the, in the social partnership context. And, and then in addition to the community uh, actors, um, statutory um, uh, sector representatives, and indeed eventually other, sector, other traditional social partners also got in on, the, on, on, these, um, on these bodies. But you can see they had quite a different origin. And they uh, had a strong emphasis on participatory methodologies and um, a, a participatory democracy. So this was, again, coming from a different tradition from the social corporatist, uh, the, the kind of tradition that uh, we, we, um, we talk about, we think about when we're looking at the, um, uh, the um, social partnership. So uh, community organizations emerged in the 1980s. Some of my slides are slightly out of sequence. Uh, I was looking at them afterwards and thinking, no, no, that, that should be before that. But if I start changing them now, it'll confuse everything. Anyway, so community organizations emerged in the 1980s. Not surprisingly, there was widespread marginalization. There was poverty. There was inequality. You know, uh, the, the, you know, the plight of women in Irish society was terrible. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was really a, a very, very dark uh, decade. And NGOs emerged. For example, the Community Workers Co-op emerged, uh, the Justice Commission of the Conference of Religious in Ireland, the Irish National Organization of the Unemployed was established, the National Women's Council, and several other organizations emerged. Now, some of these organizations have changed their names, some, some, some more than once, and I won't go into all of that because we'd be here for uh, six months if I was to do that. But anyway, they represented groups such as the unemployed, and we had long-term unemployment, the poor, and we had a huge and extensive problem with poverty. And I'm not just talking about relative poverty. I'm talking about poverty and deprivation on a very severe scale. And we also had problems in relation to marginalized areas that were seeming to be cut off and affected 
you know, intensely by uh, the problems associated with poverty. So it wasn't just an individual experience of low income, it was actually a whole uh, societal uh, sort of uh, experience affecting people of all ages. Um, and, and the position of women in society, which was, of course, very, very uh, marginal and, and very unequal in, uh, in, in Ireland uh, at that time. So these organizations began to engage with the Department of Social Welfare, they engaged with the government, uh, lobbying through the European Union, um, critiques, lobbying, protest, analysis, learning from the work done through engagement with combat poverty, putting forward new approaches to local development and uh, income maintenance. Some of these organizations, for example, the Community Workers Co-op, um, Neil Crowley in particular, uh, um, became knowledge holders on social inclusion and European funding and learned all about this sort of systems that were available for supporting new uh, ideas and innovative local partnership. Um, and they also were sort of representing a very large portion of Irish society which felt left outside of social partnership. The trade unions were there, the employers were there, the government was there, but what about all the people that weren't represented by them? And in fact, Charlie Hoy was asked about this in the Doyle one day uh, back in 1990, I think it was, and uh, he, he, was, uh, he was asked about this by, um, by, by a, a TD. And uh, oh, he says, he says, there's no need for any other you know, representation. They're all represented by the trade unions and the farmers' organizations and, and so on. So, um, and how wrong he was. Anyway, so um, uh, what we begin to see then is a kind of coming together of the two uh, areas of campaign and reform around uh, social partnership and community local level partnership. And this is really what you see in the first half of the 1990s is this kind of evolution of the two and the kind of overlap of the two in social partnership. So before the community sector was a, a social partner, they had already succeeded in winning as concessions and terms within uh, the uh, agreement in 19, uh, 1990, um, the, what we call the PESP partnerships, the first 12 local area partnership companies that were set up, and ADM was set up to support them, and um, this was the beginning. Um, and you also had um, a focus on unemployment and local development. You had the establishment of a new organization nationally called the National Economic Social Forum in 1993, which brought in all of these uh, organizations and the social partners and members of the Doyle. So it was actually a huge kind of uh, uh, forum which brought in key, uh, key players. Now I'm kind of uh, conscious that I, I've only 25 minutes and I was give myself, I said to myself that I, I could have one one minute per slide, but I haven't exactly been observing that, have I? So anyway, um, so th there were 12 initially, and then uh, in, in 1993, this um, gathered momentum, and so there were more of these partnership entities set up. And before long, there, then there were, where there wasn't a partnership, there was a community development program. So the whole country was covered in a kind of a new um, landscape of, of partnerships. Um, and, um, and so this became a key feature, and it kind of, it was, it was something that was going on in tandem with the growth of the development of, and uh, Paul studied community and youth work and got a, a qualification in it. You know, the whole professionalization of community work and youth work in the 1990s ran parallel with this. So in fact, not just was the, the landscape changing outside, but the, you know, intellectually, uh, the, and I'm very proud to be in a department which actually has been quite innovative in, in that regard and, um, uh, and contributing in, in some small way to that. So this was um, important then. So then the, the key thing came about, which was the community bodies uh, uh, looking for representation in as as the same, on the same basis as the traditional social partnerships of the unions and the, and, and the employers and so on. Uh, and, and so eventually they, they, were, they were conceded a place. So uh, it, it, grad, it was a gradual process. So we had pre-1987, Ireland was on the rocks. 1987, social partnership. The system in itself lasted until 2008. And in 1990 to 1996, we see these hybrid features of local partnership and then the community sector emerging at local level, but also at national level and seeking a place at the table at national level. So there was this kind of overlap of two, and I think it's important to, they are two quite distinct things, but they were kind of coming together at, at national level in, a, in an unusual, uh, in, in, in a new way. 
And in 1996, the, uh, the community pillar was established and they were given a, a place at the, at the table. So this led people to question, well, what is the community and voluntary pillar? What is the significance of this? It's not a trade union. It doesn't represent workers. It has no bargaining power. So what's it actually, you know, and does it have any legitimacy? This was another question. So these were the kind of questions that were asked. So, and in analyzing the, um, uh, not just in analyzing the social partnership, and in particular the community pillar, people were, were saying, well, this is just a system for incorporating organizations. That's all it's going to do. Um, so you have that analysis here. Um, two guys sitting on the side of the road. One says, I can say with confidence that I have never sold out. Um, so the argument may be that. <laughs> Um, a, a more optimistic view of social uh, the, of the, the entry of the community and voluntary pillar into social partnership was that now social partnership wasn't just about bargaining, it was about deliberation. And so all social partners had to be more reasonable and learn from each other. And they, and they had to develop more kind of porous boundaries and to be more, like, more open to the ideas of other, other groups. So this was a kind of an optimistic uh, view uh, that it was kind of post-corporatist deliberation. Um, and then there were those people like Bill Roach, for example, who argued that essentially it's still a bargaining system. Still a bargaining system, uh, you have to have bargaining power to be in it. And insofar as the community pillar have a role, they're bargaining for the social wage. They're trying to negotiate for the social wage. But uh, they all sort of saw it as a kind of a, 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 kind of a, closed, a closed loop. But nobody had really uh, done uh, any empirical research on the um, on the, uh, on, on the topic. So this is where I actually didn't really start out wanting to use big words for the name of this book that I did on the thing. It just happened that I was trying to find words to describe what I was looking at. And these are the words that kind of came into, and that was many years later. But basically, the community pillar in social partnership, uh, I carried out this study uh, and tried to explore the, the nature of the influence and whether it made any tangible gains and um, what was the nature of its influence, if it had any. And I tried to take a dynamic view. I felt that the theories that were being put forward and the, the views that were being put forward on social partnership were very static. They assumed that it would fall into this pattern or fall into that pattern. They didn't actually take into account the kind of warp and weft of how things changed over time. So you have economic cycles. Sometimes they enable the government to take credit, but when the economy goes wrong, then the government is in trouble. In those moments, relatively small organizations can be significant. They can have an influence if they're saying the right things, and particularly if they've been saying the right things for some time. So um, these kind of windows of opportunity open up. So I was interested in exploring this facet of social partnership, uh, and I wasn't really satisfied with any of the, the, the static views and conclusions that other people had, had come to. So I used a variety of methods, the usual sort of documentary and research, and I did case studies, and I looked at the pillar as a whole, but I looked at four key organizations within the pillar, and these were the, the National Organization of the Unemployed, Community Workers Co-op, uh, the Conference of Religious in Ireland, Justice Commission, and the uh, National Women's Council. I uh, thought they covered major strategic areas of policy interest and uh, were also quite significant players in the dynamics of the pillar itself. So, um, so they were kind of a, a, um, a purposefully selected sample of the, of, the, of, the, of the pillar. So these are kind of case studies. And there's a chapter on each of these organizations, and each one has its own kind of story to tell. And hopefully, instead of making a, a general statement about the whole of the, the pillar, we can actually learn about the experience of different organizations, the triumphs and the successes and the, and the, and the failures. So just to give you a flavor of the history of it, so um, in 1990, local partnership, this was a major achievement by the Community Workers Co-op even before they were in social partnership. It was a major achievement. They got this through pounding on the doors of the Department of the Prime Minister Taoiseach and, and saying, look, Europe has money, the Department of Finance isn't actually spending that money, so let's use that money. Um, trust us, we'll, you know, we'll work with you. And that was really the beginning, and the Department, the Department of the Taoiseach was willing to engage with them. And they saw the gap in legitimacy in social partnership. They realized that there was a whole you know, three quarters or a million people who felt left out of the whole kind of thing. So, um, and, and they felt that these organizations had something to bring to the table, so why not just go with them and listen to them? And so they set up these innovative social partnerships, which were quite separate from the local government system, even though they were local level, and that was an important uh, facet of the story as well. Then there was the National Economic and Social Forum. Then the community organizations got into the National Economic and Social Council, which 
at that time would draft a strategy, and then on the basis of that strategy, the bargaining would take place. So they were getting more and more upstream in the social partnership policy making process, and they were getting into the kind of the inner sanctum and where the real decisions were made. So they, they then, from 1996, they had access to all areas for a, for, for a number of years, and they were very influential in Partnership 2000, uh, which was published in 1996 uh, and, and was a, a big agreement. And one of the key things that they won at that time was the implementation of a set of recommendations which had been made back in 1986 on the introduction of minimum social welfare payments. And back in 1986, it was 60 pounds. We had pounds then, and, uh, but of course, um, these, these recommendations hadn't been implemented, even though they were, they were seen as absolutely essential to keep people out of poverty. They weren't actually, hadn't been implemented. So um, it was only in the context of the pillar being in social partnership that they actually got that. And they got it at the very moment when they were on the point of actually going on the radio to say, we won't buy in to Partnership 2000 because they're not conceding this. And there was a hurried series of phone calls made. You've got it. We're agreeing to it. And so, um, and why did they agree to it? Well, it was not long before the next general election. And um, I think politicians were beginning to uh, see that they were going to fall on the wrong side of, of things if they didn't address this. So the concession was made. Uh, and in fact, as we know, the, subs they didn't, the incumbent parties didn't actually win the next election. Uh, but the, uh, the economy took off and it was possible, in fact, to implement these, these, uh, these um, minimum payments and more uh, uh, subsequently. But they played a very critical part in ensuring that these were, were agreed at that time. And this is what I mean by um, asymmetric engagement. Small organizations at the right time with the right ideas, persistent and intrepid and determined, can actually, in moments when there are shifts in voter patterns and people are looking at the government critically, they can actually, um, they can actually these become windows of opportunity. Sorry, there are other, um, sorry, just go back there for a moment. Um, so the downside of this is that sometimes you can miscalculate. So small organizations can miscalculate. And the yellow box there is when the community platform was kicked out of social partnership in 2002. Um, and they weren't back, let back in for a few more years. Um, and they discovered, in fact, that opposing social partnership wasn't a, a right that they had. So the trade unions or the employers could say, we don't agree. And the, everything would go back to the drawing board. But the community pillar didn't have the power to actually do that. They didn't have bargaining power in that sense. They didn't have that. So, um, so there were, um, there were uh, issues around that. Um, ironically, shortly afterwards, a couple of years later, the government ran into trouble in the local elections because of policies that they'd been introducing that were quite neoliberal. And uh, the local elections saw Fianna Fáil get a, a trouncing. And subsequently then, uh, we had uh, Father Sean Healy was invited down to Inchidoni, where he gave a lecture to Fianna Fáil on social inclusion and poverty and so on. And then we see, in fact, uh, for the next few years, significant increases in social welfare payments. And these increases in social welfare payments were quite dramatic, and I'll show you a graph in a second uh, uh, to illustrate that. Uh, so that social welfare payments relative to average earnings increased by a step change. Um, and, um, and in fact, that became very significant in the context of the financial crisis that happened in 2008. Because if those increases hadn't been introduced before and committed to, they certainly wouldn't have been introduced afterwards. And uh, they did provide uh, um, an important sort of insulation, bad and all as the crisis was, uh, th th these uh, increases in uh, welfare payments, particularly because there was, after the crisis, a huge increase in unemployment. And that meant, therefore, that these increased payments were going to be very significant to a much larger section of the population. So the, another example of an area where some gains were made was in 2006 with the, uh, the, the last agreement uh, it committed to the introduction of the um, ECCE, the uh, Early Child uh, hood uh, um, care and education subsidy. So this was, a, this was an, an important um, development that, that emerged after campaigning by the National Women's Council over, over many years. So you can see that in the context of social partnership, uh, small organizations with a good analysis and a long-term perspective and persistence over time and a good grounding in, in, in principles and in, in, in roots in, in society could actually achieve something uh, if they persisted over time. And this is the graph I mentioned. So this is, um, this is uh, 2003 here, 
uh, where the arrow is, and you can see that, oops, uh, sorry, um, sorry, come to this one in a second. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so, so uh, uh, just here is uh, 2003, and you can see that all the way back to, to 1989, the percentage uh, was around about 23%, so the social welfare was around 20 to 23% of um, the average industrial earnings. But between 2004 and 2008, it increased to 30%, and that was a very significant uh, change. And that was as a result of persistent campaigning, uh, in this case by uh, Cora Justice in, through social partnership, and uh, it, it, um, it came about in, those co in that context. So um, what, what this illustrates is that over time, if you persist, if you have an analysis, if you're addressing important questions, then you might not be winning all of the time. You might not be able to bargain in the same way the trade unions bargain, but you can, by being intrepid and determined, you can actually um, uh, achieve strike uh, success at certain moments, certain windows of opportunity that open up, and that's how it works, as far as I was concerned. Um, so asymmetric engagement, what is this idea? Well, asymmetric means unequal. So unequal, for example, uh, the state versus the individual. You probably, some of you remember this picture from Tiananmen Square, uh, the tanks and the man who was standing in, and he, he walked this way and he pulled back the tank like that. Uh, I don't know what became of him, but um, um, I'm afraid to ask. But um, uh, power inequalities. Um, so you're not in a strong position when you think about the state that way. Um, you, this community and voluntary sector isn't really able to bargain. We can't arm wrestle with equality. This is a, an arm wrestling match between a, an adult and a child here. So uh, you, you can't really arm wrestle in the, in the way that the unions can with employers if you're in the community and voluntary sector. You don't have the, the leverage in that sense, and that's not really where your strength comes from, but that doesn't mean you don't have strengths. So the findings pointed to a different, uh, a different uh, account. Um, and essentially the, the, the view is that the community, it, community organizations that have a, a strong analysis and a knowledge of their area of interest uh, will succeed if they develop thoughtful policies and are prepared to persist in campaigning for them. Um, they can have success from time to time. They won't get success all the time, but if they persist, they will um, uh, meet hopefully with some success. And a key to their success is in fact shifts in the demos, shifts in the electorate, shifts in what the general public feel about government and what's legitimate. So there are times when the government feels they are legitimate, there are times when people feel they're not quite so legitimate because they're not doing the right things. And this fluctuates a lot. So civil society is all about fighting over legitimacy. Who is actually giving the right answers, addressing the right questions, and calling for the right policies. And it doesn't matter if you're a small organization of two people, there are times when if you're saying the right things, those policies can actually very quickly uh, become uh, the, the focus of the, of the um, go viral, you could say, in, in today's kind of digital age. Uh, and, and, and governments can actually, politicians can look at those policies and say, actually, we, that's what we need to be doing there, what these people are saying. You know, after many years of ignoring you, you know, they can, it can change like that. So this is, uh, this is really why um, uh, it, it, it's a different kind of dynamic that's happening here. So small organizations can often find that their strength increases at times when the government's uh, sort of ability to make decisions uh, is at its weakest. So I call it asymmetric engagement. Um, it's a different way of grasping the logic of the community and voluntary pillar from what other people have said. It stresses the difference between small organizations and the traditional social partners which use bargaining. Crucially, small organizations with a clear community link uh, tacitly relate to the demos, to the, to the, the people. Uh, and it's that sense of connection to the people uh, that, that, um, that rooted in real issues, real social issues, um, um, uh, that, that's important. Um, if, if you want a politician who does it today, uh, Bernie Sanders is a very good example of that. Um, so they can address important political questions uh, that refer to the common good, justice, equality, and so on. Now, these organizations aren't rational actors in the sense that they're looking to maximize their own position. That's not really what drives them. They're actually driven by ideas and values, and they, they, they put these ideas and value uh, forward, and they, they become advocates for these causes. 
and within that they become policy entrepreneurs. So they develop specific policies based on these values and sometimes they get, they get listened to. Sorry, sorry for the Latin here, suaviter in modo, fortiter in re. Uh, it goes back to Karl Marx, but basically firm in principle, uh, gentle in method. So if you're persistent over time, but you're firm in principle, you can succeed. So that, and that's important in terms of methodology. Um, so do they get incorporated? Maybe, sometimes, but not necessarily. Um, if you have firmly grounded principles, good research, good roots in the community, and persistence, if you're persistent over time, this will yield fruit. Uh, and, and that's something that can definitely be learned. So principled organizations with clear goals and objectives, with a long-term perspective. Windows of opportunity will open from time to time amid changing economic and political cycles. So the humor of the electorate changes, uh, the economy changes, and in those kind of changes, opportunities can happen. That's not to say you simply sit around and wait for opportunities. That's opportunism. No, you have a set of policies and you persist with them, but windows of opportunity then open up to implement those policies, and, and that's a different thing. So the locus, of legitimacy, legitim <laughs> the locus of legitimacy shifts, and um, momentarily sometimes, and, but it's in that moment uh, that those shifts can make gains possible. So uh, actually, I don't know if you uh, are aware of this, but there's actually a military analogy here, uh, asymmetric engagement. When I sat up and had my eureka moment and said, this is what I'm going to call it, um, I said to myself, I better Google that to see if anybody else has used it, because you know, these days, it's probably been used already. And when I looked it up, I actually found a thing called, well, I found two things. One was an asymmetric engagement ring, which is, we, we can leave that aside, it's, that's something completely different. And then there was something called asymmetric warfare or asymmetric engagement. And basically it's a fancy American word term for um, guerrilla warfare. So in a sense, the analogy is actually not just kind of in, in sort of imaginary, but there's actually a kind of, it's almost like a peacetime equivalent of guerrilla warfare. <laughs> so we are peace, peaceful guerrillas, if you, if you, if you want to, to put it in an extreme way. Um, so where does your strength come from? Your strength comes from your roots in, in the people, in the, in, the, in the issues, and in the, in the kind of key uh, issues that face, uh, face oppressed communities. And your legitimacy comes from the fact that you are championing those causes. And you are always kind of in that space. Now, guerrilla organizations get wiped off the map sometimes, we know, but they, um, they can, because of their uh, roots in the populace, in the, kind of, in the real kind of, not the, the popul populist's populace, but in the, in the real demos, uh, it, this, this is a great strength that they have, these organizations. And uh, persistence and analysis and faithfulness to, to objective analysis and data and using all of that strengthens them over time and deepens their roots so that uh, policymakers can't ignore this. You know, they can kind of co-opt, yeah, they can co-opt, take the policies on, implement them, that's fine. Um, um, sometimes they, they, they resist um, and sometimes they feel, well, the economy is going all right, why are you talking about this stuff? You know, uh, unemployment has gone down, why are you talking about community development and drugs? That'll all get solved down the road. Leave it to the economy. A kind of trickle-down economics thinking, you know, which uh, uh, underplays the importance of direct uh, intervention. Um, so that's basically it. Um, uh, the, the only thing I have on this last slide is just to say, well, uh, in the future, uh, where, where is community uh, sector? We know social partnership has disintegrated since 2008. Uh, 2009, the employers walked away, then the government introduced wage cuts, so we don't have centralized wage bargaining. Some of the things that were done on the community front continue to be done, but there were massive cutbacks. So um, there's been a lot of damage done uh, in a lot of ways. There's been a lot of changes of departmental responsibility, and so some areas have lost the kind of uh, the uh, intellectual capital in the in the public service, in the in the civil service, to deal with these issues as a loss of continuity. So there are real issues. Then there have been changes, cohesion um, uh, and alignment and cuts in the, in the sector. So all of these things have changed the landscape a lot. Uh, and so um, the community sector is challenged to uh, retool re, re and reanalyze and find new tactics and strategy to deal with this new landscape. So that's the situation we're in now. 
We don't know if we will have a future with, um, with uh, you know, will there be social partnership? Uh, never say never. Um, I wouldn't hold my breath, but um, uh, so some aspects of the previous experience might be reproduced in the future. Uh, I wouldn't rule it out. I know nobody's talking about it. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but given the weakness in the polity at the moment, the fragmentation of the, the, the dominant political parties and their overall weakness, it does mean that um, political parties are going to seek to be entrepreneurial. And some of them, more than others perhaps, will try to reach out to civil society as a way of uh, legitimizing their electoral bid. Okay, so watch out for those kinds of overtures and mating signals from political parties uh, uh, of different varieties. Um, a multi, um, multi party, multi party, multi partite local partnership uh, can continue to work in building democracy and then strengthening citizenship and addressing key problems and challenges. And that's maybe where some of the dots can be connected today with the work that you, you, people are doing in the, in the context of the, of the, the, the Clondalkin uh, um, task force, uh, connected out into the t areas of tackling social exclusion and poverty and inequality. Um, these are uh, vitally important and strengthening local democracy and I mean participative as well as representative democracy is, is absolutely vital in that. So a new architecture of local area bodies poses challenges but um, you know um, dealing with challenges is what the community sector does best. Thank you. We've obviously just run slightly over, so lunch is available. If you walk out the doors, it's out to the left, and I would ask people to be back no later than 20 past one so we can kick off for the second half. Thank you.